So, you've had your eye on that red Mini Cooper and now that the stimulus checks are in, you're thinking it's a good time to pick up that car. So, you've gotten everything taken care of at the dealership except signing the paperwork. And the dealer brings this piece of paper out that has a phrase you're not familiar with called an arbitration agreement. And you wonder, what exactly is an arbitration agreement? Well, stay tuned and I'll help you find out. My name's Tony DeWitt. I'm a Missouri appellate attorney, and uh, I'm, law was my second career. Blogging is my third career. So I'm hoping that uh, you'll find these missives interesting and entertaining. What I hope to do is present some information about the law that you will find useful and helpful. Now, what follows isn't legal advice, right? Because in order to get legal advice, you have to go see a lawyer and pay for that service. This is simply information about the law. The only person who can give you legal advice is your lawyer, and that's based on your facts. And the reason that lawyers get a JD degree is because the answer to every legal question is, it just depends. And what it depends on is your facts, right? So with that out of the way, let's move on to answering the question. What is arbitration? Well, arbitration is a contract you sign that takes you out of the legal system and puts you into a different dispute resolution system. The design of arbitration is to allow neutral arbitrators to make a decision and to make it quickly and less expensively than would happen in court. Now, in order to accomplish these goals, there are certain shortcuts that get taken. For example, discovery, which is normally quite a bit of work in a civil case, tends to get shortened in an arbitration. Discovery is limited by the rules. And that can work for a consumer or it can work against a consumer, again, depending on the nature of the problem and the claim. Another issue with arbitration agreements is that they tend to make a class claim much more difficult. In other words, if you have been cheated out of a $5 service fee over the course of six or eight months, uh, a six-month loss of a $5 fee is only $30. You're not going to be able to hire a lawyer to go get $30 back for you. And the likelihood that you would prevail in a small claims case, while fairly significant, is probably also not worth the time it would take. And of course, if you've signed an arbitration agreement, most times that is the only avenue you have to get your money back. So it can be good for business. It can also be good for the consumer but that's less likely to be the case in most arbitration agreements. If we examine most arbitration agreements, here's what we find. First of all, they are very broad, meaning that everything from the ability to arbitrate a particular claim to every possible kind of claim you can have is determined by the arbitrators. So, as a result, in most cases, it's difficult to escape arbitration unless the contract itself is substantively unconscionable, meaning that it's just so unfair, so one-sided, that nobody would reasonably enter into it if they didn't have a gun to their head, which is what, in most cases, a consumer does sort of have a figurative gun to their head. If they want to buy the car or close on the house, they have to agree to the arbitration agreement because otherwise the seller or the broker will not uh, engage in that conduct. Now let me see if I can explain a little bit about the process of arbitration. So I want to explain the key points about arbitration, the things that I think are the most important. Suppose you have a dispute between you and the car dealership over a bad vehicle that you've purchased. Ordinarily, you would take that dispute to court, and that's where that dispute would be settled. But in an arbitration agreement, here's what happens. You pick an arbitrator, and then the other party picks an arbitrator. And then the two of them get together and decide upon a third arbitrator. And that third arbitrator becomes the person who is the deciding vote. Things are much different in an arbitration hearing than they are in a courtroom. For example, the differences between a courtroom and an arbitration hearing are as follows. 
In a courtroom, you're not going to be able to introduce hearsay evidence, but in an arbitration proceeding, you may very well be able to. In a courtroom, you have full discovery. However, in an arbitration hearing, discovery is limited. But the most important difference is that you don't get 12 jurors to decide your case. You get people who are paid to decide a whole bunch of cases every day. Professional arbitrators. The arbitrators then hand down their decision and decide either for one party or the other. As a general rule, it is very rarely in the consumer's best interest to sign an arbitration agreement. Well, that's the long and short of arbitration. Now, am I telling you not to sign an arbitration agreement? No, that would be legal advice, and this is just a presentation on arbitration. You have to make the determination whether or not you sign an arbitration agreement, and it's always good to get legal advice from a lawyer in your jurisdiction to give you advice about whether or not you should or could sign an arbitration agreement, or whether you could escape from an arbitration agreement that you may already have signed. So if you found this presentation interesting or helpful, I would appreciate it if you would click on the like button down below and perhaps even click on the subscribe button and hit that notification bell so that you'll be notified every time I post a video. That said, I hope you've enjoyed this video and I hope you have a wonderful day.